Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for this full house. Um, as someone who spends my life working on climate change, uh, I and many of my colleagues sometimes have difficulty getting up in the morning. There's a sense of gloom, there's a sense of doom that I'm sure a lot of people share if you are following the news. Um, not only do you have in the bad news category the uh, announced withdrawal by the US president from the Paris Climate Accord um, just last week, he said that uh, Paris would have been a disaster for our country. Uh, you have the EPA dismantling the Clean Power Plan, which was one of the main tools to try to meet the US obligation. You read the news, there are disheartening stories. US Energy Information Administration says that after three years of remaining constant, US emissions are starting to rise again. Stories about whether the Paris commitments in and of themselves, even if fully met, would come anywhere near addressing the uh, limit that we need of one and a half or two degrees. And uh, there's a draft report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change circulating that two weeks ago uh, came out where they say in their draft, there's a very high risk of exceeding the one and a half degree Celsius threshold by the 2040s. With all that, it's hard not to be pessimistic. It's hard not to be concerned. We already see some of the adverse effects happening. And I know that in the previous speakers in this series, you've been hearing about some of the other adverse consequences that we can expect. The melting Arctic ice caps, the sea level rise, the intense storms, the ocean acidification, I could go on. But that's not the topic of my remarks today. What I'd like to do is instead look at the other side, which is the good news. Why, in fact, do I feel comfortable getting up in the morning and continuing to work on this issue? And the reason is there are some very good things happening. And a lot of them are not as well known as some of the things that you've seen, including uh, the announced withdrawal from the US Paris Agreement. So that's what I'd like to focus on. The other thing that gives me hope is coming to talks like this and seeing such a full room. Because frankly, your interest, dedication, commitment to finding solutions to this problem is what's going to get us out of it. My generation screwed up. Some of us are still trying to do what we can, but we really look to you as well. So thank you very much for coming today. So why don't we start first with the Paris Agreement, which you have heard about. I'll assume that you're familiar with it, but just very briefly, what are its key features? This is the latest agreement under something called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was agreed among countries back in 1992 and approved by the US Congress in record time. So we are a party to the framework agreement. The goal of the Paris Agreement is to establish a long-term framework for reducing climate action, reducing climate emissions with regular five-year opportunities to go further. The goal is to limit global warming to well below two degrees centigrade, um, with a further goal to aim for reducing to one and a half degrees centigrade, which was at the insistence of especially the small island states who at two degrees will be underwater. So they're very invested in trying to get to one and a half degrees. Another aspect of this agreement is a goal of carbon neutrality worldwide by 2050, which is really ambitious when you think about it. The idea that carbon sinks and carbon removals by 2050 would be the same as the amount being emitted. Finally, um, every country has its own uh, commitment. It's called a nationally determined commitment, or NDC. A key feature of the agreement is that these are voluntary. Each country got to come up with what it felt it was capable of doing. The United States commitment under this agreement was to re reduce nationwide our greenhouse gas emissions by 26 to 28 percent below levels from the year 2005 and to do that by the year 2025. It's important to know that this is a nationwide commitment. It doesn't depend just on actions by the US federal government. The agreement also has a robust reporting and review regime so that is, even if countries' commitments are voluntary, they have to report how they're making progress toward that. So that was agreed in Paris in December 2015. In record time, in only 10 months, enough countries in the world ratified that agreement uh, so that it entered into force, which is extremely unusual for an international agreement to enter into force that quickly. 
the um, criteria for that were that there had to be 55 parties representing at least 55% of global emissions. So big players, notably the US and China, had to join in order for that to happen. So now we have the uh, US intention to withdraw, which was announced last June by, the Trump, by President Trump. And I want to pick that apart a little bit on what exactly that means, because I think a lot of people think we're already out of the agreement, and that is not true. The rules built into the agreement are such that once you're a party and the agreement enters into force, no party can withdraw until three years later. And then once you do announce that you're going to withdraw, you have to give everybody else a year's notice. And if you count back from when this agreement entered into force, that means that even if the Trump administration goes forward full bore with its intention to withdraw, it can't withdraw until November of 2020. Well, if you're counting, if there were a different administration that wanted to rejoin, we could be out for all of two months. Um, and it's important to know that while the US is watching the clock until it can formally withdraw, US negotiators are still going to these meetings, participating actively in some very important pieces of that agreement, which are writing the rules to implement the transparency requirements and the rules for the stock taking. And so they're, they're um, an active voice in creating an important and effective architecture. And that's, that's been something this administration has been okay with the US negotiators doing. So while the US is intending to withdraw, what's the rest of the world doing? I mentioned that it had its rapid entry into force, which usually takes a very long time. The, the way I would look at this is it's such a statement of high level global recognition of the problem and the urgency of the problem. There were high level signing ceremonies throughout 2016 with heads of state attending. Um, you had, uh, when the United States announced it was going to withdraw, you had, or actually right after the election, you had a real effort by other countries to say, that's not going to matter, we're still going to buckle down and implement this agreement, this is the future. Um, every other country in the UN is now a party to the Paris Agreement. Uh, going into this past November, Syria and Nicaragua weren't yet. Nicaragua, because it thought it wasn't strong enough, Syria because they have kind of other things keeping them busy at the moment. But in November, both of them joined the agreement, meaning the US is the only party not to the, in the UN, not a party to this agreement. So as countries, so it's not just enough to be a party, right? Are countries actively trying to implement their commitments? And I would say, yes, they are. Um, each country's commitments vary, so, and they're not ambitious as they need to be yet. We mentioned that already, but you see things like, here's one example, just one example of what's happening out there that you don't always hear about, and that is electric vehicles. Numerous countries are committing to switch to 100% electric vehicles in the not that distant future. China has announced their plan to sell only electric new cars. They haven't set a date yet, but people think it'll be by sometime in the 2040s. India has, India has a target of only electric vehicles sold by 2030. Britain of 2040, France of 2040, and Norway is committed to going to all electric vehicles by 2025. And there are many examples out there of things that are happening at the national level. So that's the Paris Agreement. In parallel with the Paris Agreement, there are other areas of progress internationally which um, I'm going to focus particularly on today. Um, in 2016, while we were pushing the, while the United States government was pushing uh, toward the entry into force of the Paris Agreement, there were two other agreements being negotiated that year, um, both of which I was involved in, so I have a, uh, particular fondness for them, but also per perhaps in some insights into that process I'd like to share with you. Um, and unlike the Paris Agreement, both of those agreements come with strong bipartisan support, strong industry support, and there's a good chance the US will stay in those, implement those, and go forward with those. The first one is the uh, Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, which Peter mentioned uh, this is a, an 
amendment to phase down the use of hydrofluorocarbons. The Montreal Protocol, if you're not familiar with it, was an agreement uh, first uh, negotiated in, to address the hole in the ozone layer, to phase out the use of chemicals that were dangerous to that, notably chlorofluorocarbons and hydrochlorofluorocarbons. Um, and those are also potent greenhouse gases. The fact that the Montreal Protocol has successfully eliminated CFCs and is well on the way to eliminating HCFCs has done a lot to actually postpone the day of reckoning on, on global warming. But we also discovered, scientists discovered along the way, that the most popular alternative to HCFCs are these hydrofluorocarbons, and they turn out to be extremely potent greenhouse gases, as in one ton of carbon dioxide is a one. A hydro, an HFC can be somewhere between 12 and 10,000 times more potent as a greenhouse gas. So when that became known, an urgency to addressing HFCs got itself onto the global agenda. And HFCs are coolants. They're used in air conditioning, including both buildings and cars. They are used for refrigeration, also for foams, for meter dose inhalers, for some other things, but especially for cooling. And when you think about looking ahead, the world's getting warmer, the population's going up to nine, nine and a half billion and beyond. People are getting wealthier, which means they want more refrigeration, they want more air conditioning, they want to drive more cars. If we didn't switch off of HFCs soon, their use was going to grow enormously, such that it's estimated that this amendment that was negotiated has the potential to avoid up to half a degree of global warming this century. We are trying to limit warming to one and a half degrees or two degrees. That's extremely significant. So this agreement, this amendment was successfully negotiated, um, concluded in October of 2016 in Kigali, Rwanda. And the Convention for International Agreements is they're named after wherever they are finally agreed to. So this is the Kigali Amendment, which was a point of significant pride for the African countries who participated in these negotiations. What does it do? As I said, it has the potential to avoid up to half a degree of global warming. It was negotiated as a phase down, not a phase out of these chemicals, because we don't yet know that there are alternatives for all the uses, particularly meter dose inhalers, frankly, and some kinds potentially of large building air conditioners. Most developed countries are supposed to start reducing from a baseline of 2012, the year 2012, uh, by next year. By 2019, they're supposed to be 10% below their 2012 levels. Most of the developing countries, including notably China, agreed to a somewhat delayed but also ambitious schedule of, by 2024, freezing their production and consumption and thereafter declining it gradually to 85% below their baseline levels by 2046, 2045. There's another group of countries, India and the Gulf states, that needed even a little more time, so they have another four years before they peak and start to phase down. There's another provision in there that's uh, effective for helping countries want to join the agreement, which is that after 2033, uh, you can't trade in these substances with countries who are not party to this amendment. And that's worked very well for the previous four amendments to the Montreal Protocol, which each one of those amendments has every country joined it, um, which is, again, extraordinary in the international realm. One of the reasons that the Montreal Protocol has worked well and that we think Kigali will work well is that there's something called the Multilateral Fund that's a built-in institution of the Montreal Protocol, which helps provide capacity building and financing for developing countries as they make their transition from the phased out or banned chemical to the alternatives. And good news, this past November, um, countries, including the United States, agreed to replenish the multilateral fund for the next three years at $540 million. So that's 
a good, good way forward. You also have a commitment from the philanthropic world. You have private foundations putting up $53 million specifically to help with the transition focused on energy efficiency. And that is, as you're switching to these other chemicals, it can also be an occasion to switch to new refrigerators, air conditioners. And we've discovered in the past that that can be a real opportunity to increase the energy efficiency of those appliances. Uh, the potential of the Kigali Amendment is that switching to much more energy efficient appliances across the globe can double the value of the Kigali Amendment. So there's another half degree potentially. So, will this be like Paris? Will the US pull out? Will the US join? Um, the signs are actually fairly good that this will go forward. Um, it is uh, an agreement that we have for all the previous amendments, taken them to our Senate for advice and consent, which is a two-thirds vote by the Senate in favor. So it's expected that for the U.S. to become a party, we, the Trump administration or a successor administration will have to decide to do that. Um, you have some good signs. Uh, the agreement has already entered into force for the countries who have ratified it. It took only 20 countries to, for that to kick off, and it's now in place for those countries. Um, in November, at the annual meeting of these parties, uh, the State Department representative was authorized to say that, speak in favor of the Kigali Amendment, that it, U.S. believes it represents a pragmatic and balanced approach, um, and that we have initiated the process to consider U.S. ratification of the amendment. So that was a very strong positive signal. There's broad coalition of support for this amendment from industry and the environmental community. Uh, industry, uh, in part because U.S. companies uh, are good innovators, believe that they have already uh, developed some of the best alternatives to HFCs and will do more in the future. So it's a real economic benefit to our industry for this amendment to enter into force. So, in fact, as a result, they have been taking the lead in building support for Congress ratifying this amendment. Um, there's a uh, Actually, a symposium a couple weeks ago, if you've heard of the Hudson Institute, it's a think tank that's quite conservative. Uh, they had a half-day symposium of industry leaders uh, and academics talking about the importance of the Kigali Amendment and what a good idea it would be to implement it. So I take that as another positive sign. There is, however, uh, a little bit of a caution, which is that this White House representative at that symposium did say that the Trump administration was studying it very carefully, needed to be convinced of the economic value of this amendment, that it would in fact be good for consumers and good for jobs. So I think those are marching orders to the affected industry to develop that, that case and bring it to them. Another sign, I think, of the strong industry support for this one is that EPA had been writing regulations to already reduce the use of HFCs in the United States. And there was a lawsuit in the DC Circuit decided last September that found that EPA in fact did not have full legal authority to do that. And if the US ratifies the Kigali Amendment for some complicated legal reasoning, then EPA will have that authority. Uh, the environmental community thinks the case was decided wrong and may appeal it to the Supreme Court. But meanwhile, a bipartisan group of senators have introduced legislation to clarify that EPA does have that authority to go ahead and start phasing these chemicals down. And these were uh, the Republicans from Louisiana, where Honeywell has built a big factory to build the alternatives to this, but also uh, Democrats and Republicans from several other states together trying to make this happen. So that's the Kigali Amendment. Um, another international agreement that was concluded in 2016 is from a completely different sector, which is global civil aviation. And a little bit of background on that. Uh, the Kyoto Protocol, which is an agreement to regulate greenhouse gases under the UN Climate Agreement, 
basically excluded from its scope all the emissions from international aviation and international shipping. And when you think about it, you can see why. Because the basic actor taking on responsibility under these agreements is the nation state. And emissions from aviation and from shipping happen between countries. And it would be very complicated to try to figure out who, which government should be assigned responsibility for those emissions. And so those were not covered by Kyoto. And so the UN bodies responsible for those uh, sectors of the economy were supposed to go take action in that area. On aviation, it's a UN International Civil Aviation Organization called ICAO. And on shipping, it's the International Maritime Organization, or the IMO. Well, um, it took them quite a while to get their act together. Uh, and why is this important? Well, focusing on aviation, aviation is actually 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And that is also expected to grow significantly. Again, as the developing world becomes more prosperous and those emerging economies uh, become wealthier, there will be much more air traffic within them, as well as across countries. It won't just be the global north and people in the north going on vacation in the south. There's a lot more air traffic, both for moving people around the world, but also shipping that's expected to happen. So that's a real area of emissions growth and also then a significant part of the problem. In fact, aviation emissions are projected to grow 5% per year beyond 2020. So ICAO was supposed to address aviation emissions. And it took a long time to actually step up to the plate. Part of what forced it to do so or persuaded it to do so was the European Union, tired of waiting, decided to bring emissions for flights coming to and from Europe under the responsibility of the European Regional Emissions Trading System. And once they announced that intention, suddenly all sorts of countries found that that was an incredible affront to their sovereignty. And that just couldn't happen. And therefore, they finally said, no, we must go to ICAO and solve the problem there. And meanwhile, actually the aviation industry saw that it was in its interest to support a global uh, agreement that would assign uh, responsibility across global aviation consistently. It, what they would hate is a patchwork of different responsibilities where you had to do this for Europe and that for Australia and that for uh, the United States. So they were strong proponents of an agreement in this forum. And also, they look at their passenger base, which I hope includes a lot of you in this room, and people who want to fly, but they want to be responsible with respect to climate change. And if they can drive or take a train, they might instead. So the industry very much wants to be seen as responsible on this issue. So in fact, first the industry and then ICAO adopted a goal of global civil aviation emissions being carbon neutral after 2020. In other words, any growth in emissions after 2020 would be offset or they would limit their emission rate to 2020 levels. There are also other things the aviation is trying to do. Um, they call it their basket of measures. Uh, ICAO also developed uh, emission standards for carbon dioxide in February of 2016. They are working on sustainable biofuels and also air traffic control. If you think about when you're circling an airport, all the emissions that come out of those flights, uh, next gen improved uh, air traffic control can also significantly reduce emissions from that sector. Anyway, um, the ICAO agreement negotiations were done in 2016, also came to a successful conclusion. Um, part of what made it really challenging, uh, for, if, for those of you who follow the climate negotiations in other fora, especially the UN, there's always this dynamic of developed versus developing countries. And the idea that the developed countries, as the historic source of the problem, should go first, they should take the lead, they should help finance the developing countries' transition. Well. ICAO is governed by an entirely different agreement, the Chicago Convention, and its bedrock principle is that of non-discrimination. 
every country has the same obligations. And so to try to bring a climate negotiation into that forum, where you had to find a way to balance non-discrimination and what's called common but differentiated responsibilities in the climate world, was a real conundrum. And it took a long time to figure out how to devise an agreement that, that everybody could live with. Um, but we did. Um, and the basics of that agreement, first, it is the first global cap on emissions from a particular, of an entire industry sector. You think about that. Nowhere else has there been a cap across the world for one particular industry sector. This is global civil aviation and it now has a cap. There's a lot of interest in replicating that. The countries who negotiated this agreement tried to make very clear that it was a one-off, that it was not a precedent for anything else. But as I'll mention a little more in a bit, there's already effort to try to replicate this in the International Maritime Organization. The basic scheme is for airlines to have to obtain offsets for their emissions growth above their 2020 levels. And the reason that this is an offset program is because it's very difficult to reduce emissions further in aviation itself. When you think about it, the main source of their emissions is their fuel, which is getting the plane from one place to another. They have very significant economic incentives to reduce those emissions already. So that's why the planes are, have those little wingtips on them and they're lighter and lighter and they crowd more people into them and they charge you for your luggage because they're all trying to reduce the amount of fuel they use already and that's a way of also reducing their emissions. So until sustainable biofuels really take off, they needed to fill this gap with this market-based measure, this uh, program for offsets. The um, scheme begins in 2021 and it goes through 2035. There's a voluntary phase for the first three years. I'm sorry, a pilot phase for the first three years, then a voluntary phase for the next three years, and then obligations kick in for the rest of the countries. Um, I mentioned trying to trade off this who goes first one of the ways that we finally reached agreement to do so was to create this pilot phase and that the first phase would be voluntary, which was a great concern to the environmental community and those being ambitious because of fear that nobody would sign up to this voluntarily. Um, interestingly, the dynamic was such that it was almost the reverse, that the major aviation countries who knew they ought to be in there signed up and then you had all these uh, less developed countries, even some of the least developed countries who were never going to have to do anything legally under the agreement, went ahead and signed up because on being on the receiving end of the problems of climate change, they wanted to get this agreement as comprehensive as possible. And the emissions count only if they are flights between two countries, both of whom have obligations under the agreement. So if um, a Pacific Island signs up for this agreement, even if they don't have to, then all the flights to and from them by airlines from big developed countries count and have to be offset. So even before the agreement was concluded in October of 2016, over 60 countries had volunteered for the pilot phase and the first voluntary phase. And we now have 72 or 73 countries who've signed up, representing more than 87% of global aviation traffic. And again, as a sign of, uh, I think, optimism, or good sign for this agreement, uh, Saudi Arabia, who is not usually uh, seen as a leader on addressing climate change, joined this agreement in March of 2017. So well after they saw the uh, political direction that the U.S. is going to be taking on climate change in general. So will the U.S. join this agreement? Remains to be seen, but I think uh, generally positive signs and also, again, like Paris, like the Kigali Amendment, the rest of the world plans to go on ahead anyway. And uh, you see a couple of things. 
Um, one is to look at the history of this negotiation. I mentioned how the US and other countries uh, very strongly opposed the EU uh, bringing international aviation into its system. One response of our Congress was to pass legislation that I've never seen before, which there may be, oh, there's one other example, but basically what it said in the terms of this statute was that US airlines were prohibited from complying with the Europe, European system. Um, and the bill, also the statute also said, instead, the US must work with other countries in ICAO toward a global agreement. So you have this bipartisan passed by a Republican and Democratic Congress signed by the president saying, go to ICAO and bring back this agreement. So there's a strong argument to say, that's what you told us to do. Now we need to participate in this agreement. The Federal Aviation Administration, which will be the part of the US government responsible for implementing it, uh, announced publicly uh, last May their ongoing support of this agreement and their readiness to move forward with its implementation. Good sign. Um, they may need some legislation in order to complete their authority to implement it. Uh, so watch and see how, how that happens. Um, the industry in the US remains strongly supportive of this agreement. Um, A4A is the trade association for global civil aviation and uh, they've repeatedly committed publicly to their ongoing support and their readiness to move forward with its implementation, um, including for the aircraft emission standards as well as this one. Um, I didn't mention the name of this. It's called Corsia, um, which is a bit of a handful, but it's a Carbon Offset and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation, Corsia. And the R in there, reduction, was important to countries like Nicaragua for showing that this is not just about offsetting, but it's also to improve over time. And there are every three years a review built into this agreement so that it can ratchet down uh, and be more ambitious over time. And for those who wonder whether that will happen, my aviation colleagues said, just look at noise standards. The first time ICAO decided to ad address noise, the standards they came up with for noise were very weak. But over the years since that happened, noise standards have become more and more stringent around the world. So the expectation is that over the life of this measure, up to 80% of international aviation emissions above 2020 would be offset. Another thing that's positive about it is, you may be wondering, where will all these offsets come from? And one of the puzzles, one of the pieces of the puzzle for addressing climate change is making sure that tropical deforestation is slowed, halted, because so much carbon is stored in those trees in those countries. And there have been efforts to find a way to monetize the standing trees and that those could generate uh, units of carbon that could be bought and sold so that those who do not cut down the trees get some economic benefit for not cutting them down. The system is called RED, Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. And for quite a few years, there's been a lot of effort to build up this RED program. Quite a few developing tropical forest countries bought into it. But so there was a fair amount of supply coming online, but there was no demand for these red credits. Uh, once the, the US was going to buy a lot if we'd passed legislation in 2010, the Waxman-Markey bill envisioned a lot of forest credits coming in. Um, the European Union hasn't been willing to include them in their system. So there's been not a market for these forest credits. And there is a significant hope among the folks who work on those issues that international aviation will create finally demand for those credits and help us keep the forests standing at the same time that we're trying to address global aviation. I mentioned the International Maritime Organization, just very briefly about them. Um, 
Again, this is a significant sector of global emissions expected to grow. Um, from the period 20, 2007 to 2012, um, shipping produced approximately 3.1% of global annual CO2 emissions. So that's greater than aviation, in fact. And again, interconnectedness, more global trade, wealthier world, more and more shipping, greater emissions. So if, um, if you don't regulate emissions from shipping, it's calculated that it could represent some 10% of greenhouse emissions by 2050. IMO is several years behind the aviation world, I would say, in addressing their emissions. There have been standards put in place to improve the energy efficiency of, of uh, ship engines, though there are debates about how stringent those are. There are some countries now pushing that it follow the aviation model of capping the sector and having an offset program for it. Uh, watch that space. I don't know whether that will happen or if so, when. Um, but again, history repeating itself. The European Parliament uh, last February proposed legislation that if IMO doesn't act by 2023, they would bring shipping into the European emissions trading system. So you might have a repeat of that dynamic, but the rest of the EU hasn't yet taken up the European Parliament's idea. I just want to say a little bit more, and then I really want to leave a lot of time for Q&A and discussion of, of these issues of interest to you, if they're of interest to you. Um, but, but another area where I find hope and reason to uh, see positive progress is the reaction of the rest of the United States to the federal government's announced withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. And I guess the, the main message I have there is one federal administration cannot stop this agreement from being implemented internationally or even to significant part within the United States. That target that I mentioned, the 26 to 28 percent reduction in U.S. emissions by 2025, is not just reductions taken by federal action or federal law. It's sort of, think of an envelope over the entire United States. And Emission reductions taken voluntarily by industry, by cities, by states, by any of you walking instead of driving, it all adds up to the potential for the U.S. to reduce our emissions. And the um, one clear response right after the election and the Trump administration's announcement of withdrawal was a coalition came forward called the We Are Still In Coalition. And this is a group of more than 2,500 leaders, Fortune 500 companies, small companies, mayors, governors, uh, faith leaders, university presidents, all saying that they will continue to do everything they can to reduce emissions in the areas they're responsible for to continue to work toward the U.S. meeting its goals. And as part of that, there's going to be a Global Climate Action Summit held in California uh, this fall, I think in September, which uh, is another forum for those who attend to make their commitments outside of the UN negotiating space. I think it's extraordinary the, the different fora that are popping up to address this issue if the US isn't going to take Paris seriously. Another one is uh, this past December, the French held a special action summit on the second anniversary of the Paris Agreement to bring in, again, uh, subnational actors, companies, other countries to re re retake their vows, to reiterate their commitment to the Paris Agreement and its importance going forward. I mentioned California. California, um, if California were a country, any idea how, if its economy was a country instead of a state, any idea how big it would be, where it would be ranked? Close, or well, I may vary, maybe fifth by now, but last time I looked, the World Bank in 2016 said sixth, okay? Sixth largest economy in the world is one U.S. state. So if California says, we're going to address climate change, that's a big signal to the rest of the world. That's a big part of the solution to the problem. California is about 1% of total global emissions. Um, 
It has legislation called AB 32, which just last year they extended and strengthened further. It includes a cap and trade system. If you've been following this issue, you know at the US federal level, cap and trade is a dirty word. Um, California has a cap and trade system. California's cap and trade system now trades emission credits with Quebec, with Ontario. There's talk about Mexican states being part of this process. So again, sort of not entirely bottom up, but below the federal level, you have efforts to address the issue, not just nationally, but internationally and across borders. California has HFC regulations that they're putting into place. And um, with respect to automobile emissions, uh, this administration has announced it does not plan to go forward with making uh, fuel economy standards more stringent for automobiles. For a long time under the Clean Air Act, California has a waiver so that it can have more stringent standards than the rest of the United States. Well, sixth largest economy in the world, if California will only buy cars with more stringent standards, that means that all the automakers basically follow the California standards instead of less stringent federal standards. So I would expect that California will not weaken its standards if the federal government does. There may be litigation over that, we'll see. California's been very clear that if the federal government tries to tell, us it, tell it it doesn't have its waiver, they will push back and uh, they plan to do it anyway. Um, and I don't think I would wanna fight them. Um, what about this seaboard, New York? Uh, has anybody heard of REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative? Yay! <laughs> we have cap and trade here in New York. Um, REGI is a regional scheme of, for many years, nine states, capping emissions from the power sector, being able to trade across uh, companies, uh, both within the state and across state lines, with a cap in emissions that ratchets down over time. Just in this past year, uh, with change in administration, New Jersey, which had pulled out under Chris Christie, announced that it's rejoining REGI. Virginia has announced that it will join REGI, so that's expanding the number of states that are capping and reducing emissions in their power sector. And um, in 2017, REGI announced new targets, which is their cap reduction between 2020 and 2030 will be another 30% below emissions from 2020 levels. So that's, that's significant. And the reduction of emissions in the power sector are being facilitated by the availability of cheap natural gas, which is, that is what is crowding out uh, coal. It's not um, regulatory attacks on coal, it's that natural gas is a more cost-effective alternative for the power plants. Um, so that's happening. Also, wind and solar are getting cheaper and cheaper in a fair num number of places. They are now at parity with natural gas as a source of, of emissions, uh, as a source of fuel for power production. And so you can see those continuing to, to expand around the US and around the world, frankly. I mentioned cap and trade. It's, it's having a resurgence elsewhere as well. Uh, China has seven pilot, seven regions have pilot programs for a Chinese cap and trade system and they have announced that they are going to have a nationwide cap and trade system and are working toward putting that in place. So a lot happening, cap and trade, state level. One last thing I want to mention is the World Bank as an international institution, uh, which uh, historically has uh, not always had the best reputation in the environmental field. Um, also, they funded over the years many coal-fired power plants in the developing world, a lot of hydroelectric dams that flooded uh, a lot of areas. There's a, quite a history there, but they have um, been moving in a much better direction from the term, from the perspective of reducing greenhouse gases. Since 2010, the World Bank Group has no longer funded coal-fired power plants. And just this past December, at that summit that the French president held that I mentioned, the uh, World Bank announced that starting next year, it will also no longer finance upstream oil and gas extraction. So the World Bank is basically getting out of the fossil fuel business with very limited exceptions for 
uh, oil and gas projects in the very poorest countries that do not otherwise have access to power and where building such a plant doesn't conflict with that country's commitment to reduce its emissions under the Paris Climate Agreement because everybody but the U.S. is a party. Everybody but the U.S. has some plan to address its emissions. So that's why I'm not doom and gloom, I'm hopeful. Those are some of the things happening out there that I wanted to make sure that you all knew about as well. And at this point, I'm open to questions. Thanks for that question. Um, I may not have explained that clearly. HFCs are a class of compounds. So there are a lot of different HFCs used for different purposes. And for many uses, there are already identified alternatives. Some of them are already being deployed. In fact, in the United States and Europe, we're confident we can meet our emission reductions, or the Europeans and Australians can meet their reduction target by 2019 because they know and are already using a lot of those alternatives. Like Heineken worldwide is no longer using HFCs uh, as a company doing a good thing. Uh, some of the alternatives in the refrigeration area are things like propane or ammonia. Um, so it's not just having to invent a fancy new chemical. One of the concerns in the negotiations was the cost of the alternatives. In some cases, an alternative exists, like for uh, automobile air conditioning, but it's under patent until 2024 or 2025. So that's why some of the obligations are delayed until after the patent wears off and they're cheaper. The, the reason we, we still anticipate countries being able to use 15% of the baseline levels is that we don't yet have alternatives identified for some uses. And maybe by the 10 years from now, those alternatives will exist and we'll amend the agreement to phase out completely. But there, there's actually a lot of alternatives already uh, available. Sure. Uh, California as you said, it's been sort of a leader in a lot of environmental uh, action. And uh, the governor has been in a leadership role in a lot of that, and he is not going to be eligible for re-election this next time around. There's been a lot of noise, and it is only noise, in some of the Northern California counties, as you may be aware, they want to split off from the rest of the state. But the fact is that there's a lot of dissension there. Uh, are you concerned that California is going to learn or is going to lose that leadership position because of political pressures and political change in, in the state? Thank you. Um, I'm not particularly concerned for a few reasons. One is California has had a long history of being ahead of the rest of the country on environmental issues through Republican and Democratic governors. Um, the climate law that I mentioned, AB 32, was actually uh, developed with the strong backing and, and signed by Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was governor. So there's a bipartisan history of, of climate regulation in California. California has, as some of their economic drivers, Silicon Valley, which is very interested in clean technology and going forward with that. Um, and you don't know what, where the politics will go, but I would be surprised if a candidate for either party for governor took a strong anti-climate position in that 
in that campaign. So. Hi, Jennifer. Thank you for that. Sure. I'm Allison Chatterton. I work with Peter. And so I have a question. Um, if you could give us some perspective, I think students might be really interested to know what it's like to be a negotiator and to be involved with some of these global negotiator negotiations on the climate change, the Paris Accord, or the Montreal Protocol. Sure. Um, well, let's see. Uh, a couple of things. One is, Sometimes the idea of the international diplomat or the international negotiator is seen as some sort of junket, that you're going to all these cool places and you get to go to all these great restaurants and meet all these interesting people. Uh, I can attest that that is absolutely not true. Um, many times, especially when I was a US trade negotiator, the only way I would know I was in France instead of somewhere else was that my breakfast had a croissant um, because we all go to rooms without windows and spend all day and all night negotiating with each other. And there's a, there's a rhythm to that. But, but I think that what, a couple things that, that I could say about that. One is you do meet interesting people from all over the world because especially at the multinational, multilateral negotiations, your counterparts are people from every other country. And so you really have to learn what they consider their national self-interest in these negotiations because you never reach a deal unless everybody gets out of it something of what they need. So there's a, there's a lot of learning about the other country, their domestic politics, their economics, uh, who are the factors that weigh into what they have to respond to. Um, being a negotiator from an English-speaking country is vastly easier than being one from somewhere else because English is the lingua franca of global negotiation. And so uh, even if there's tra simultaneous translation in big formal meetings, when you get in small rooms, or when somebody's putting a text up on the board to work out the language, it's all done in English. And so if that's your native language, or you're very, very good at it, and you know what it means to put the comma this place instead of that place, or leave the comma out, that gives you an advantage, uh, which may or may not be fair, but that is the, the world we're in right now. Um, the, 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 the international system can be incredibly frustrating about how slowly it moves. Um, it can take years and years and years of uh, countries obstructing the process. It's very easy to throw procedural roadblocks into a negotiation if you are not yet ready to reach an agreement. Like this Montreal Protocol Kigali Amendment that I mentioned. <coughs> Proposed amendments were first tabled in 2009 and not until after the Paris Agreement in 2015 did enough countries say, okay, now that we've figured out Paris, we're finally ready to go negotiate that HFC amendment about that other greenhouse gas. And then we did it in a year. In the climate negotiations, I remember, I mean, the trade negotiations, uh, the United States has a policy of doing environmental reviews of trade agreements, kind of like NEPA reviews of projects. Um, but as we were developing the rules for those environmental reviews, uh, and people proposed that the environmental review be done halfway, at the halfway point of the negotiations. One of uh, my bosses at the time, a very seasoned trade negotiator said, halfway through the negotiations is the night before you conclude the deal. So <laughs> they take forever and then they come together quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was very interested in Saudi Arabia's role in kind of global climate policy because I know in 2015 I um, read a lot about how they were trying to, like you were talking about obstructing procedure, they were, um, I think they were one of the only countries that were against the 1.5 degree Celsius cap on global warming. They were arguing for um, like a larger cap, which a lot of countries didn't want, but then now we kind of see this reversal 
And I think um, I saw articles in the room called like the Silicon Valley of the Middle East, and they're talking with Google and they're, you know, talking about renewable energy. So I was just wondering um, what you think, like why we've seen such a quick reversal in their kind of policy from a oil state to this more technological green state, and if it's maybe because they realize that the world is shifting to renewables, or it's because they realize that during the Trump administration, the US, they, they can kind of get a leg up on the US, if that makes sense, in the mm -hmm. renewable mm -hmm. sector. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering what you think the reasoning is for their kind of flip-flop um, reversal on the policy. I'm not sure I'd go so far yet as to say it's a real flip-flop. But I do think that Saudi Arabia and other Gulf oil producing states are looking to the future, to a world where um, there will be much less demand for their oil. And it can be somewhat analogous to the tobacco companies diversifying, recognizing they could not base their economies entirely on that. Saudi Arabia, I think, has a very difficult transition ahead as uh, the price of oil may not stay where it needs to be. They have a growing population. They have a lot of people who need jobs, and there aren't jobs in that economy. So it's very much in their national interest to be trying to diversify. Uh, another country in the region that's uh, very interesting in that area are the United Arab Emirates, who have really tried to position themselves as a renewable energy hub. They, they pushed in one uh, host country responsibility for a UN body, IRENA, which is the UN Agency for Renewable Energy. So it's, uh, it's got a ways to go, but, but they're moving in that direction. Another thing with Saudi Arabia on the HFC amendment was uh, reducing emissions from HFCs doesn't hit their bottom line because it's a chemical that isn't oil or it's not a fossil fuel. So if they, you know, one of the arguments that people used with them was, this is a place where you can show leadership on climate change without it hurting you, you economically. Here's a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for giving the speech and I really learned a lot and through your information and um, um, I have a question about the solar panel because you mentioned that wind and solar are becoming cheaper and cheaper. So what was your thought about the reason that the Trump administration that incre uh, having this like solar panel tariff and in order to like um, create more jobs and then how would that having like impact for um, like the US policy after the Paris Agreement? Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, good question. The, uh, the decision to uh, impose higher tariffs on imported solar panels is one that is controversial within the solar power industry in the United States. Uh, the companies who wanted the tariffs manufacture uh, directly competitive solar panels and felt like the Chinese panels were uh, priced below market and undercutting them. There's a large portion of the US solar uh, power industry which is about assembly of panels from components, including from China. It's about installation. And um, there are many, many jobs on that side of the equation as well. And so probably at least five years ago, th this, this debate has been going for five years. And, and just now, under this administration, did the solar panel producers uh, prevail to get the, the tariffs put on. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if China challenges that in the World Trade Organization, so we'll see where it goes. But those disputes take several years, so there will be maybe enough years of protection for the US industry that they'll then you know, uh, not mind if the sanctions are lifted down the road. But, but it's a... It's a, it's a tension across a lot of aspects of environmental policy, including various parts of the renewable energy space, which is how do you lower the cost to increase deployment as much as possible, everywhere possible, but 
uh, not hurt your own economy too much in the process. Um, there was a US challenge to India as well on solar panels that uh, was controversial. Anyway, back in the way back. Thank you. Um, I, I wondered if you could put your pessimistic hat back on just for a second and try to give us an insight why the Montreal Agreement was uh, thought of as more or less successful and why Paris, even if we stay in it, uh, as you suggested, might not actually avert a climate disaster. So what, what are the differences in the calculations that are made by states like the United States specifically that make the global warming issue uh, different than the ozone depletion issue? Sure, good question. Well, for one thing, the Montreal Protocol, even starting with chlorofluorocarbons, but going all the way through HFCs, is a much more discrete problem, right? It's a limited class of chemicals for a limited purpose, relatively small number of producers, relatively small number of countries that produce them. Um, there was, uh, s starting with a scientific uh, paper in 1974, uh, clear scientific evidence of the hole in the ozone layer that countries got behind. It wasn't, it wasn't politically divisive. The Montreal Protocol originally was uh, strongly supported and advocated for by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. Um, it, has, it has a scientific body. It has a, a long history of uh, helping countries transition so that the, the, the existence of the multilateral fund that provided money to the countries that needed to make the changes built confidence in this as an institution. On the UN climate side, Think about what a broad problem climate change is. All the different sources of greenhouse gases, all the different sources of carbon dioxide. We're all producing it as we breathe out. Um, but carbon dioxide isn't the only gas. Methane from rotting vegetation. I mean, every sector of every country's economy is implicated in trying to address climate change. And unlike, uh, under the Montreal Protocol, you had very vested interests in the fossil fuel industry. So the biggest source of emissions had very powerful interests trying to maintain the status quo. Um, but I do think the Paris Agreement is, one of its strengths is that it's a framework that can be strengthened over time. You don't have to go back again to negotiate yet another agreement. Countries can strengthen their commitments over time, and the hope is that we'll create a culture in which that happens once we get past the US uh, non-participation at the federal level. So, thanks. Anybody else? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you talked about like political and economic hope that you had for the world, but do you think that there's also like social hope? Do you think people are changing their minds about glo like global warming and what they can do to deter the effects of global warming at like an individual and societal level? Well, I think before you get to what people think they themselves can do, you have to look at uh, recognition of the problem and the urgency of the problem. And the United States is pretty anomalous in the fact that we have a public debate about the reality of the problem. Um, when you go to these international fora, that's one of the messages to really take home is that everybody else there <laughs> recognizes the urgency, recognizes the importance. It's about how, not whether. And so that's, that's something that, that I think there's a real disconnect in this country right now between the powers that be politically and the public. When you look at the surveys that are taken, I think 70 or 80% of the American public now believes that humans are causing climate change and something ought to be done about it at different gradations of, of urgency. And 
over time, as the effects are increasingly obvious, uh, the man-made snow at all the Olympics these days, um, it's, and that's, you know, that's, that almost feels like a frivolous one, but it's not because there's a big business in winter sports. But, but all the droughts, I mean, some people would argue that the conflict in Syria was triggered by people needing to move from uh, drought-stricken rural areas to cities. I think last week your talk was all about migration, and the, so you guys know that. Um, what individuals can do, I think that everything makes a difference. The, the, probably the big lever we need is a clear signal of a price on carbon, because that's such an efficient way to uh, affect decision making all across and people will move toward the most efficient way to reduce their emissions. But, but it's also the case that there, because it's such a widespread problem, there are solutions everywhere that need to, we need to come up with. In the sociological side, the technological side, the diplomatic side, everywhere. So. Mm -hmm. We have one more question from online. Okay. So we have an online audience, and there's a good question here from Eleanor. So she asks, uh, the displacement of coal by natural gas is partly a good thing, but partly problematic. Um, it burns more cleanly, but its production emits lots of greenhouse gases, including uh, powerful ones such as methane. Is it just a question of accounting for emissions at different points in the supply chain? The questioner makes a good point about natural gas. Methane as a gas is way more potent than carbon dioxide. So 20%, 20 times more over 100 years, maybe 80 times more potent when you look at just 20 years out. So natural gas is better than coal as a fuel stock only if you control fugitive emissions all along the production and distribution and consumption side of that, which is why uh, rules to control the venting of natural gas from production sites matter, um, to um, improve that. It's uh, even natural gas, I would say, there's a recognition that we are not going, we don't have enough capacity for renewable energy yet. Natural gas, probably even some coal, is a necessary part of a bridge toward a renewable energy future and present, um, but if done responsibly, controlling the fugitive emissions, uh, gas is uh, more climate friendly than coal right now. But if, like even buses, natural gas buses, if they're not, if they're venting the natural gas, that's not always great. So, anyway. Okay, um, thank you, let's thank the speaker. Mm -hmm.